five, four, three, two, one. All right, welcome to the Danger Zone. I'm here with a good friend of mine named Nicholas Lott. How's it going? What's up, dude? What's happening? And today we're going to dive into how circumstantial life is. Jesus. <laughs> and Cutting to the core. Yeah. <laughs> and how um, circumstances brought us together and how life doesn't always go as planned. Right. Yeah, that's for certain. Yeah. And how kind of some unique, silly, almost injuries brought us together ten over over ten years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And jeez. Dating us. Yeah. And, Dinosaurs. And how we're still um still friends to this day. But let's uh let's dial people in. Let's let's go into like, what are you up to now? Like, what are you doing? Uh, I'm doing the exact opposite of the things that I did in the military. Uh, I am an architectural intern at a uh, architecture firm in Louisiana, uh, Lafayette, Louisiana. And, uh, yeah, I got my master's. I got my undergraduate in uh, architecture at ULL. And then I got my master's, and I'm finishing up. And, uh, yeah, I work as a, as an architect here. Yeah. It's awesome having a, a friend as an architect. Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, we're driving around here and it's just like constantly just pointing out buildings like, oh, so this building, blah, 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 blah. And I, <laughs> the, you, yeah, you this, just, this is this. This is this. I get this yeah. whole laundry list of. Uh, you get a free tour guide. Yeah. Yeah. My younger brother is that way, but with geology. So I have like. We have my, both sides. Yeah. yeah. yeah I get they have like, the man made and the, the nature made. Yep. Yep. And so. Um, but yeah, I always yeah I enjoy uh, I enjoy learning about new things and like architecture is one of those things I don't mo- know a lot about. So yeah, yeah it's yeah. cool hanging out with you and getting kind of like a little bit of downloads from yeah, just from, a little yeah, bit, yeah. just a little bit. You don't want to scare them away. Yeah, you just uh, drop a little bit and then back off. Yeah, I don't I don't know, man. Uh, I got into it uh, strangely through, as you said, through injuries and that kind of stuff. And I don't know if you want to go all the way back. Yeah, let's let's go. Let's let's go back to. Um, I mean, you you frame it up how you want. You can you can say like, kind of what happened that steered what your plan was. Yeah, sure. And like what you're kind of going for when you when you joined the military. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What went you know? What went right? What went wrong? Yeah. Or not necessarily that, but what what happened that changed your course? Of life, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? I think that's that's kind of the underlying theme. Is, yeah, um, yeah. So I, I joined the military, uh, got involved at the dive mo. If you remember the <laughs> great dive mo, the dive motivator. <laughs> oh God, so yeah. moto. Um, and wanted to go. Um, matter of fact, I had uh, it all stemmed from uh, uh, I failed out of college, uh, majored in architecture. Strangely. I think I just chose something. I was like, oh, Arctic sounds cool. But I didn't really show up for class. I immediately uh, went, went out a bunch uh, in this uh, great city of Lafayette. Yeah. Uh, shout out to the keg and uh, all those amazing shitty bars that we went to. Um, and then from there, um, knew I didn't really didn't want to be in school and knew I, didn't, uh, knew I wanted to go to college at some point in time. I was kind of looking in. I worked offshore for a bit. I did kind of the gambit of things. Oh, yeah. That's, you just reminded me. That's what I was going to ask you about uh, today. Yeah. Oh, offshore? Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. God, what a horrible, horrible. Uh, but luckily, I met some. I met two guys. Again, circumstances. Yeah. met a guy that was in the Air Force for many years during the Vietnam era. And uh, he had said some stuff. And just, just some interesting. I was interested in it. And he was like, are you thinking about joining i was like no 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 no. I just, I, and he had some crazy stories about nam about uh he, he always referred to it as saigon <laughs> going to saigon yeah um i don't know what he did i think he worked on aircraft but i don't know why he would be in, uh, land-based because he was yeah uh, i don't know if uh we had God, some air bases over there really like, yeah um i honestly i don't oh god i can't even remember his name funny really funny guy had like three <laughs> Uh, uh, Asian wives. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> well, not at the same time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Spread about. Uh, he was like, "Oh, my ex-wife," and he showed me a picture. I was like, "Oh, okay." So he said that. And he's like, "Oh, my ex-ex-wife," and he showed me a picture. And I'd be like, "Oh, there seems to be an underlying theme." Uh, 
But uh, yeah, he just talked to me and talked to me kind of about the military. My dad was in the military. He was in the Navy uh, during the Vietnam era. Yeah. Um, and I I was inkling. I wasn't quite sure. I went and worked for the state for a little bit. And one of the guys there was a Navy diver. And he's the one that kind of pushed. He's like, you should go corpsman. And I was like, I didn't know what corpsman was. I didn't know what any of that is. If I even ever did join, he was like, if you're looking to go into SEALs, uh, or a special warfare in general. Mm-hmm. And actually, it wasn't even about uh, Navy or anything like that. It was like, if you're looking at special warfare, and I, I was reading um, uh, good books if you're looking to go to Bud's, uh, Dick Couch's uh, books on, uh, he has one on Bud's, he has one at SQT, and he has one about deployment and downrange. Yeah. Um, I think that, that one's called Downrange. I read those books when I was in high school, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The finishing, finishing school, right? Yeah. Um, and so he, he had directed me to those books, and then was like, you should go corpsman because you might be able, let's say SEALs don't work out, whatever. There's Marine Recon. There's, there's options that you have. Yeah. And so I enlisted um, a little bit after that, go, went corpsman, was looking to go that route. And uh, while at dive mo, uh, I busted an eardrum. So I did that, and that kind of sidelined me for a little bit. Then I had some shoulder problems, which I've always had shoulder problems, played uh, football and Messed up my uh, shoulder, and it was dislocating a bunch, that kind of stuff. And you're a wrestler, too, right? And I was a wrestler. Um, and, uh, yeah, uh, shoulder was really dislocating a lot. Uh, like, I would do it, and it would dislocate. And uh, then they, they did – so I have already had one surgery. So then they had to do another surgery. So I probably got pulled out of the whole pipeline while at – what was it? PSIing. Mm-hmm. While PSIing. Uh, I got pulled out of the whole uh, pipeline for that. Uh, worked at a hospital for a couple years. Finally got back in it. Went to uh, uh, wait. When did I break that? Then I broke the foot. Broke the foot. Then I got. I got all. All that was better. Uh, finally, uh, they they plated my foot, uh, fixed it up, and they were like, "All right, you're ready to go. Go to FMSS Field Medical School." Uh, I was going to go recon and. Uh, uh, while there, while I want to run with you, uh, this is the second time I broke the foot. Uh, I stepped on something or whatever, and it cracked the. There's a plate underneath, and then there was a pin, and I broke the pin, and uh, then I was sidelined again. Yeah. Uh, and that's uh, enter into the fray, Fire Team Brown. Yep. Um, yeah. That's where I met you, and uh, while on hold there, we became friends. Um, with we were under uh, one chief, Chief Doran. Shout out, Chief Doran. Yeah, wherever you are, you're a weird guy. Yeah, probably still finding pictures to this day. Oh God, he is finding so many unruly beautiful, pictures. Beautiful man. He yeah. called me years after that. Uh, uh, to preference, this is at the height of the "Don't Ask, Don't Tell" amazingness that was the military. And um, uh, during this time, they were like, "Don't ask, don't tell. You can't put gay stuff," which just. Uh, allowed us to do more and more gay things. Yeah, just encouraged us. Yeah, encouraged us to, to walk that line. And uh, we had um, n- not photoshopped, literally cut pictures of ourselves, pasted us on naked men, and photocopied that around in little small cards and hid them all over his office. Yeah, like GQ. Or no, no, not GQ. GQ yeah, the, Gucci. And Gucci like, and like all that. Yeah. Um, we had photocopy all those and put them around in his office in his uniform behind pictures for, for him to discover. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the best, I think the best, uh, ever we did was behind his like plaques and yeah. we're like, when he goes and moves offices years later, he's yeah. going to discover these naked pictures behind when them. he's like in his old age and he's like, yeah, Oh he's man, like, let me these are a little look. dusty and let me. T- take this certificate out and Chief dust it Black. off it, and there's yeah. going to be that like crotch, like right in his right face. in his face, and yeah. it just says from N and D. Oh, actually, it, it was premature. He knocked down his. Remember, he knocked down his his chief's plaque. Yeah, it was on the wall and knocked it down while in like a meeting with a with an officer, mm-hmm. and the officer did not find it funny. He found it hilarious because it was. Yeah. Uh, but the officer was like, "Oh, what's that? Was your chief's plaque? You know, whatever. It's got weight to it." Yeah. How dare they? How dare they mock him it with the with the naked homoerotic <laughs> material, softcore homoerotic porn? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and that's where our legacy starts: <laughs> hiding naked pictures of men behind chief plaques. 
Yeah. Um, no. Uh, so I, honestly, I so I I had always wanted to be in special warfare. I always wanted to uh, be an operator. Never uh, achieved status. Uh, so from there, I got injured again. Eventually, I had another surgery on my foot. They pinned it up all nice and neatly again. I finally healed from that. Let's see. So that's three surgeries in. Yeah. And uh, eventually, uh, uh, it wasn't. My foot still is not healed to this day. Uh, the the way they did it, they uh, drill bits and they try to. The bone was basically dead, and so they had to yeah. try to. Uh, drill into it and cause more uh, damage to try to get more blood flow to it, but the blood flow had stopped because I'd been in that cast for I don't I don't even know. And then they, they then they had to do another surgery after that. So uh, yeah, so to end it all, I had another surgery and then eventually got med boarded out. Uh, Two thousand and nine. So I was med boarded out and was feeling pretty. Uh, wouldn't say good. I was glad to be out of the military. Yeah. Uh, but always regretted not doing what I wanted. Actually, a, a large portion of my regret uh, was in training with you guys, training with a, meeting some of the best, best possible possible people that you can meet, and just feeling like you're kind of sidelined. Yeah. You know? Like, oh, I could have been doing this. Instead, I was, uh, uh, you know, stationed at a hospital, uh, and I was stationed at a horrible short duty. Horrible. Um, I mean, well, mine, the general surgery, uh, Naval Hospital was great. Uh, shout out to all the people at general surgery, Naval Hospital, yeah. uh, Camp Pendleton. Uh, but, um, I mean, just in general, I was, uh, you know, you, you just feel a lot of regret just watching your buddies go off to war and come back. Yeah. Uh, and knowing, feeling like you couldn't really contribute or you didn't, um, it's always the thing. Um, even nowadays, mentioning that I was in the military, they're like, "Oh, did you deploy?" Yeah, and it, it's that I want to say yes so bad. Yeah, and you say no. Well, I, I didn't deploy. I was stationed in California. Yeah, and they're like, "Oh, okay." Well, you know, they, they, it's a little bit less, and they're looking. They're looking for that story too. They're looking for, "Oh, yeah, deployed twice to have get." Whoa, whoa. Thanks so much. You know, yeah, I mean, I don't which know. is which is weird because sometimes I get. Um, People people ask me like if I deployed, and what's interesting it is a big coming from somebody who didn't even serve in the military at all, right? And they'll go, you know, oh, did you deploy? Or whatever. I was like, you know, so I'm like, yeah, I deployed three times or whatever. You know, like, oh, where I'm like Afghanistan, and then they'll be like, well, I know this guy that deployed like 13 times. <laughs> it is, yeah, 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 you know, and can't one up that guy. Yeah, it's just like there's. Some 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 people you just can't uh, are insatiable when it comes to um, needing to almost give themselves self importance by like belittling whatever it was you did you know whether that's like oh you didn't deploy like while you're serving you know yeah it, 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 without or, a doubt it definitely like, changes the tone of the conversation yeah whenever they're like yeah or they just let it be a disappointment to them or something but it's weird you know yeah I mean. Look, they they want to meet one of the guys that fought over there, right? Mm-hmm. I, I can see it whenever they're like, "Oh, you you were in the service? Oh, did you did you deploy Afghanistan?" Sometimes they don't even give you the choice to where you deployed. They go Afghanistan or Iraq. Yeah, they give you the give you the end door, and you're like, ah, California, San Diego. Um, yeah, man. It, it for a while it it bothered me. To this day, it bothers me. Uh, not in the same capacity that it does now, uh, but in the sense of uh, it has nothing to do with uh, other people's expectations. For a while, it was. Yeah. Uh, now it has more to do with uh, the men and women uh, that I served with that went over there. I just feel like I got left on the, the sidelines. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I, I don't think I will ever go away. Um, just tends to happen. But uh, apparently, life had other plans. Yeah, and that's uh, what we're here today to talk about. I don't know. Uh, yeah, so while in the the community, when I'm meeting such uh, illustrious human beings as yourselves, <laughs> and uh, and the other guys that are at FMSS, and uh, the other guys that I met and uh, that went on to buds. Matter of fact, man, how many guys do you know? Ex like ex div guys, buds guys, um, and. Uh, 
recon guys, they're the same. They're just, they have similar kind of traits. Yeah. I, I don't know. It was it was a weird thing that um, I, and even guys uh, Simpson. I don't know if you know Joshua Simpson. Uh, he was in a class with us. Uh, he fell out of buds. And he was a ringer. I think he fell out. Fell out once. And then went the, just a regular Marine Corps unit. Mm-hmm. Ended up winning the Silver Star. Oh wow! Uh, really good guy. I have no clue where you are, Joshua Simpson. Yeah. Uh, you're a bud. Um, but um, I mean, just just the quality of human beings. This was just so, immense. So what did you? So so what did you do with that regret? Where did it turn from something that was yeah. like kind of? Uh, I mean. Was it kind of like ruling your life during a certain period of time, or was it like oh, when I was injured, man? Yeah, when I was injured and everyone was over there, yeah, and uh, you guys were going out, you had passed BR, uh, BRC, and you guys had gone, and I was injured. I mean, I didn't, uh, for a while, I was stationed at the Wounded Warrior uh, Barracks mm-hmm. after when I got stationed at um, Balboa Medical Hospital, and I was having my uh, third surgery, third surgery before the fourth, um. Yeah, man, uh, it was it was really rough in the sense of like I just felt like everyone was leaving me behind and that kind of stuff. The one thing that I will say is that working at uh, it wanted to, it was just a barracks. Uh, I don't think it was sponsored by the Wounded Warrior. I think it was just a barracks um, at uh, Balboa Medical. Uh, uh, it's like connected to the hospital. I, I don't know the yeah, actual yeah. name of it, but uh, I had roommates there that didn't have legs. I had, um, I saw guys without legs and that kind of stuff. So like, I was feeling real sorry for myself and real sorry for like my situation and that kind of stuff. And seeing that kind of helped, kind of help, you know, perspective is everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then once, uh, once I got a second chance on like, well, once I, uh, they transferred me back to Camp Pendleton. Um, I worked up there, I med boarded, and got out, I was like super happy. Like, what what do I do? Yeah. I got the second chance at things. Hmm. Uh, what do I do? I immediately enrolled uh, in school, went back to school, was in the medical route. I was a corpsman. So Which was, made sense, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. You just fall back into the thing. And while I was doing it, I was, and I can't, I can't say, at the time, you never, it's, it's, one thing I've noticed is it's very hard to know what you're feeling at, at a time, right? Because emotions yeah. run so high, right? But in like self-reflection and kind of going back, man, I was so unhappy, so unhappy. And I just didn't have, I liked it, I liked it, yeah. but it wasn't like when I was with you guys and I was like kind of working towards being an operator, I was working towards being in that pipeline. You kind of had to want it. You had this fire, this kind of, this drive in you. And I didn't, I didn't have that at mm-hmm. this thing. And I just knew that it wasn't right, you know? And then, uh, uh, go figure, I get uh, more injured, uh, if that's even possible. <laughs> um, I, uh, they found a hernia. I was lifting for a little bit, and uh, they were like, oh, you, you have a hernia. I was like, oh, okay, well, they're like, you'll, you'll have surgery this weekend. I was like, oh, okay. And I was laid up for a while, and I took up an old craft that I thought I would, that was long gone. Um, in high school, I, I used to be, I, I wouldn't say like, I was like one of the top guys in high school as far as drawing goes. Yeah. But I wasn't, I was I mean, what does that mean? You know, how many, how many top football players uh, do you know that like don't do anything? And I, and I was, you know, it was a hobby. I liked it. I, I could draw from a picture. I had some formal training. I took some art classes, but nothing, nothing professional or nothing like that. Yeah. And all I did was uh, after I had surgery, I was laid up for a while. Um, I, and it was abdominal surgery, so I really could do nothing. Abdominal pains, like oh, terrible, man. dude. I mean, I've had the shoulder, I've had the knee, I've had the foot. Uh, all of them were bad. Um, but when it's isolated to your like uh, the uh, the just right there, it, it, laughing, talking, walking, sitting, laying, all affects your abdominal core. Yeah, and. I mean, when it's isolated to like kind of a limb, you can be like, okay, don't move that limb. Shoulder, shoulder was a little worse because it's kind of connected to your body. Uh, Foot and that kind of stuff, it was like, ah, it's down there. It's fine. Uh, But yeah, it was was rough. Um, 
Yeah, help me out here. Where yeah, you s- so you started drawing. Oh, so I started you're drawing. Like, you're, yeah. yeah. So I started drawing again, and I just couldn't stop. I would just use pictures. Again, no formal training, just kind of try to copy a picture. Mm-hmm. And I found after a while that I could copy a photograph pretty well. Like, no training, just kind of going with it. My mom was, and of course, my mom was like, oh, it's gorgeous, you know, whatever. And I was like, ah. So for a while, uh, I just started, started just drawing. And I was like, man, I should, maybe I'll just take one class in like art or something like that. And then I remembered out of the, out of the, uh, in the abyss of my mind that, oh man, I majored in architecture one time. Maybe I'll just take an art architecture course. Yeah. And just on the side, I was, uh, I was a scrub tech here in town. And yeah, also, so, so this is like after you're getting out. Like after you, I'm getting you, out. You're in Louisiana. You're in Louisiana. You're trying to work in the medical field. Yeah. But you picked up drawing and now you're like, hey, maybe I should yeah, go yeah. back to the architecture I, thing. And I literally just took, as a summer course, mm-hmm. I'm just, just going to take one architecture drawing course. That's what it was. Yeah. And I took it and was like, again, immediately felt that fire. Immediate, immediately felt that... Uh, not that challenge, especially architecture, because it wasn't just art, it wasn't just uh, painting or anything like that. It was this um, science, and I've talked about this before with you. Is that in the, in the art that I really like is the art that's channeled through this kind of parameters or or this measured sense of data that then becomes kind of more. Right, so that, that's what I think architecture is. Is yeah. is, is this built cult- cultural ambitions of of the people, channeled through kind of an architectural agenda, and it's it's all these things: math, science, history, all the humanities combined with art, combined with you know the wants of the architect, combined with the wants of the client, and it just made something kind of. It was this conglomeration of all these things that I really loved. And kind of brought back all the loves that I used to have back, back before the military, before right. I ever even thought about being uh, in the military and that kind of stuff. And man, when it came back, it came back with a vengeance. So I immediately, uh, so I immediately switched all my classes, went back into architecture, graduated top of class, you got that fire again. Got, man. I yeah. mean, that's what, that's that's what it took. Uh, as soon as I got it back, I, I and and. That's what the military kind of got out of it, is that when you can recognize that fire, that's important. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of a self-reflection, that idea that, uh, that when you can recognize, oh, this is, this is good. It's not that this is it, not this mm-hmm. is the thing, but this is challenging me. This is something that I enjoy. This is something I'm good at. It's, it's kind of a threefold, right? It's this like, is forward progress. Right, like- right, right. I'm getting better as a human being. That, that's what mm-hmm. actually I, I really didn't miss uh, is that w- uh, this kind of self reflection that you can kind of you can kind of see the progress. Um, like in the uh, in the military, you can always see your progress. I'm getting better at this time. I'm getting better at this. Uh, I'm noticing things differently. I'm, I'm I'm getting I'm getting faster. You can kind of notice your progress. This self reflection, and what I found uh, I couldn't do in, in the the medical field or in general, I just didn't have that fire or that want to get better mm-hmm. with this. I wanted and wanted and still do to this day, want to get better. Yeah. And it was this really weird, but really nice kind of self reflecting kind of self evident thing that I found inside myself. That was like, I said myself like 10 times right there. Um, but yeah, man, it was just this kind of, eye-opening thing that I and again this goes back to circumstance I mean so many things happen for circumstance and uh, I try to to explain this earlier but um, the idea of kind of water kind of running down and hitting this kind of let's say like rocks yeah right and kind of it hits a rock and kind of goes a different path and then hits another rock and goes this other it, it chooses that least amount of effort and goes that way, where the way we were slow, and honestly, man, I, I hit a I hit a gap with my body for whatever reason, uh, all those injuries, and uh, that opened up this other door, and this other door is, I mean, I I, I don't I I know for a fact I wouldn't be here without the military. 
Yeah. Which is really strange because all I wanted to do in the military was was strive to be the best and to operate with you guys and operate with other people. Mm -hmm. And uh, it turned out that 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 wasn't what uh, I could do, nor uh, I don't think I would get the fulfillment that I have in that that I do get in my work currently. Right. And if you'll allow me, I'll compare that to sort of... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. Um, back back to just even like the regret piece, right? Yeah. So I think a challenge of a lot of veterans, whether deployed or not, like it's it's missing that camaraderie a lot a lot of like the companionship that comes from like being in the military and you're like it's the the tribalism right where you're you're in this thing together and you know my my time was ended early because of some medical circumstances right i got Mm -hmm. wounded and like it was out of my hands you know and so I deal with those feelings, right? And it's something that I've recognized that it's just going to be like, this is something that's going to be with me the rest of my life, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm always going to wish that I could, you know, there's always going to be wars coming up. There's always going to be, you know, guys getting jacked up in those wars or, you know, whatever. And I'm going to be like, hey, I should be there with those guys. Like, why why am I still not in, you know? You you think think about it today? Do you think about like... Yeah. Do you watch current events? Yeah, I watch and, current events. I, I like, you know, see, you know, things escalating with North Korea and like, you know, S- Syria, Iraq, you know, guys going over there and stuff. And it's just like, you know, you, I start to think of, well, you know, I'm sitting here talking with you. I, I still have all my limbs, right? I should be there, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in reality, that's just not the case, you know? And... Yeah there was things that happened that sidelined me, you know? And so I think it's, it's healthy to just recognize that, you know, the regret is a normal thing. It's, it doesn't have to be this like haunting, oppressive feeling that I have the rest of my life. As long as I just can recognize and be like, okay, Hey, you know what? I'm probably going to feel like, you know, the more these wars come, kind of I'll still always have these feelings popping up. And it's not necessarily like a constant thing, you know? Right, right, yeah. Um, because er- early on when I transitioned out, I made a decision that I wasn't going to let th- that those feelings of regret or like that I'm missing out dictate my life, you know? So instead I decided to put it in a chapter. Hey, this was that chapter of my life. Here's, you know, what I learned in it and this is where I'm going – to the next one you know yeah so i think that helped me a lot with that but um it's just like just comparing it to yourself i i can identify with what what you're going through and like how um you know you have you have this feeling you don't know what's in the future and that's like you know my military career getting into into early too you know i was planning on staying in i was gonna like be a master chief you know stay in until they like you know said, hey, you're, you're too old to be a master chief anymore or something, you know? We so have, We have all those red bars. <laughs> for they'd, days, yeah. They'd be red. They wouldn't yeah. be gold. They wouldn't be gold? No, yeah. they wouldn't yeah. be gold. But, but yeah, and, and things change, and I think a lot of good can come from that. And, like, with what happened with you, you know, you were kind of exploring the medical route. You are working as a surgical tech. Um, for me medicine is like what most people would think I would get into. It's like the next common, you know, yeah, com- you, common you could, sense step where, Hey, you're, you're a special operations medic. Like you need to apply that into the civilian world. Like go be, go to PA school, like go, go to med school or, you know, or become a paramedic at the least, you know? Right. And I really, I didn't feel that fire or a draw to it and it's something that i still may you know touch in in the the future like i'm I'm interested in you know training people in emergency medicine and things of that nature but uh here i am podcasting and like (laughs) you know and uh off-roading and you know hunting and all, all these other things that um 
really have nothing to do with medicine, you know? Yeah. I mean, then I'm finding tons of fulfillment out of it. And I think that's what you're talking about. It's like not these, these circumstances, they happen and, you know, you, there's a million different ways you can look at it from, you know, Oh, is there this part of the divine? Is this, you know, by, you know, chance, like what is, what's happening here? But, uh, there are just a lot of things circumstantially that happen that leads you to a certain point in your life. And I think something that you're touching on with the water flowing down, right. And you're kind of like, you hit these stones and go this way and go that way mm. is the point is the water's still moving, right? Key. Yeah. Stagnation is the worst. Stagnation is the worst. If you ever find yourself in one of those periods where like you have the regret or, you know, and then you, I guess that's what I was talking about when you let it like rule your life or dictate your life and put you in a state of stagnation where you're no longer moving forward to find that next rock to bounce off of. Right. Yeah. yeah. You, you stop the flow, you dam it up. And now, you know, that's, I think that's where problems come in your life. So it was, it was really cool as your friend to see you just keep moving forward and like figuring out what, okay, hey, what's next? Like, hey, I'm doing the surgical tech thing for a while. And then also having the, like, mental fortitude to, like, when that little little uh, hints of doing something else came up, you're like, yeah, and made the decision to do it. As opposed to, like, hey, because the medical, medical field is very lucrative, you know? Right, It, yeah, it yeah. can be very, you know, financially stable, people are always going to be sick and dying, you know? Yeah. So it's a very, like, um, as far as job security goes, it's a very safe route to go. And so just as your friend, it was cool to see you go in a different direction and, like, you know, follow, you know, follow your heart's guide or, or, or whatever, you know? Yeah, I mean, like, you could say heart's guide or, yeah. uh, or however you want to say it. Um, I definitely... Uh, and of course, it was a dabble, right? I mm-hmm. just took a, one course. I was like, let's just, like, this thing's going on. Let me just see. And once I got it, man, I got, once I got that bug again, that, that yeah. itch, I mean, a lot of people say bug or itch or fire or whatever they want to, I mean, you, you can really, you can really feel it. I mean, mm-hmm. I could really feel that th- Here was one of the things. I would stay up. You know, I would stay up for days. One, I mostly because forced to, but I would stay up regardless. Um, but oh, we have this project due, whatever, and I really wanted to get it good. I'd stay up, uh, you know, all night, whatever. Or sometimes I would. One of the things that uh, it would happen, uh, especially uh, in the military, is not only would you stay up or whatever, but you also you would want to do the extra work, right? So when everyone went home after class. I would stay a little bit and kind of tinker with things, kind of work on things and that kind of stuff. But th- that want to th- – now now it's on your time. You have free time right now. Yeah. You can do whatever you want, and you go back and do what the thing that you were doing, right? And the same thing for – like in the military, I remember in DIVEMO, uh, amazing DIVEMO uh, core school. Uh, but I remember on Saturdays, we didn't have to work out. Yeah. I think it was on Sundays. And me and the guys would get together and we'd go do a run, swim, run. Yep. But that was just a thing. That's it. We wanted to do it. We wanted to get better. Yeah. Um, I was really bad at swimming. Buddies would help me out in the pool on, on Saturdays and Sundays. We would go to the pool and help me out. That wants that need to get better and the want to help uh, to get kind of work on the stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, I need to get better. I, need to, I, I have problems. Right. I need to work on them. That that want and need to do it, even after like they're like no one's forcing you to do it. Yeah. No one can. Yeah, it's one of the great things about special operations in general is that no one's fo- no one's forcing you to be a special operator. Yeah. Right? It's volunteer. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's completely it's, volunteer. Right. No one's yeah. no one's putting that gun yeah. to your head and saying that, that. So you don't you get a different quality of human being. Yep. And I would say I agree with that. Uh, I would say in general, you uh, one of the things to, to recognize that fire, regardless of you know. Whether it's your job, whether it makes you money or not. Mm-hmm. Actually, I can't remember who quoted this. I'm going to ruin the quote. But uh, uh, it has to do with uh, do what you love. Later on, find out how it can make you money. Right, yeah. The, I, I, I'm misquoting it, I'm sure. But um, uh, do whatever you love. And then later on, you can figure out how to make money from it. Yeah. But it it seemed to me, once I got into uh, uh, 
this particular curriculum, the the architecture kind of thing, and then then of course my drawings a day that I post on Instagram, Nicholas Lot. You can follow me on Instagram, Nicholas Lot. Shameless plug. Yeah. Uh, please I, do. Yeah. Please, please do follow him. And he actually did a piece on me, uh, which is which is on there. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I think I think it's really good. Daniel the Barbarian. <laughs> uh, no, uh, I I started. Uh, that was a thing. Literally, uh, I watched a podcast slash show but a guy that had cancer and mm-hmm. does a drawing a day oh wow and i was like man that's really amazing kind of inspirational and uh, i was like well i have lunch time i can go eat and i'll do a drawing a day and i, I even i even lessen it i just do dr- one drawing uh, uh per five days so all the days that i went to work i was like i can do one drawing at lunch every day mm-hmm. so i've done that one drawing at lunch today even did one today uh, I did one before our lunch together. Oh, okay, which, yeah. which, which, which we, we also had a drawing at. Yes, we. It was a it was a three way drawing mm-hmm. contest. Yeah, I think you won. I think I think it was unanimous <laughs> with, the, with the shrimp lord, yeah, the, the lord I, of the lord of the. Uh, I think it was unanimous. Yeah. We were, it was really funny. Uh, uh, if anyone doesn't know, uh, Dan's uh, wife is a, a very gifted artist, and mm-hmm. uh, uh, she does this amazing piece. I do this kind of architectural thing, and Dan does this. Uh, amazing uh, Lord of the Prawns. Lord, <laughs> Lord of the Prawns. And we were all just put to shame. And we were both like really jealous. But we didn't know how to say that. We were like, oh, well, yeah, yours is okay. What yeah. Nick means to say is like, they had to, you know, pat me on the shoulder and be like, oh, you're special too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah it's, a, it's art. Yeah. Tap, yeah. tap, tap. Yeah. yeah. Three yeah. taps. That's, that's things you move. Yeah. Um, but yeah, man. Um, so, uh, back to the architecture piece, dude. What, yeah. what I find really uh, fun, I, I mentioned it earlier, like just uh, walking around with you and seeing buildings and stuff, but really getting into, I had no idea so much thought went into a lot of these buildings and like, the the way you know we're gonna have sunlight coming through this thing and it Mm -hmm. has like there's all this like deeper meaning that most people you know unless you're like kind of into it or you know the situation or the history behind the building and stuff like that you'd have no idea and it's just like i think that stuff is really cool it's it's quite a shame but it's 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 its own language architecture is its own language it's its own visual form uh, I think back in the day, it used to be very much. I mean, come on, the first churches were the first movies, right? Mm-hmm. Um, they were telling a story. Uh, Notre Dame, uh, the uh, Hunchback of Notre Dame, in it, uh, um, there's a little section about how the book killed architecture. <laughs> uh, it's it, it literally stops his uh, magnum opus novel to write a small. Uh, excerpt of how the book killed architecture and yeah. just by uh and in the sense it's it's a it's a not a literal translation but uh architecture was the way we passed down ideas and it was the phenomenon that happened in the architecture it's the way light comes through it's the way the space so what what rituals we did which dude even back to the megalithic like yeah, uh, yeah. cemeteries mean, that buildings where the Light comes in only at one like time of year, time, like it runs yeah, yeah. down the center of this hallway and stuff. Well, I mean, uh, Stonehenge literally yeah. is a giant um, kind of calendar kind of situation where it has, um, you know, it has the winter solstice mm-hmm. and has a particular point where you stand on the winter solstice and you, you sacrifice on that altar. And that's what it's made for. Uh, now it has a bunch of other meanings too. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think. One of the things that I've always been interested in is kind of the rituals that we kind of established to these buildings that have long since gone. Actually, one of my my thesis, uh, which I've explained to you several times, mm-hmm. it, mostly because it has to do with the kind of military, yeah. but it literally draws on the rituals that we see in the military and kind of translate that into built form and how the built form can enhance and literally pass these rituals rituals down dude why don't, non- why don't you talk about your thesis, oh, thesis. If, if you want to yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. it was a uh, navy seal memorial and museum uh based around um several key rituals that happen at buds and it was stationed uh the whole thing was uh at uh or uh at uh, on coronado island which is a really interesting site if you ever mm-hmm. look at like 
I mean, it's it's the weirdest thing. It's that Naval Special Warfare Base combined with North Island Base or a regular base combined with a tourist town combined with like golf courses and like all touristy town combined with that kind of hotel because it used to be a tourist island. Yeah. Uh, and it's just a very weird, lucrative three things kind of mashed together all on this less than like two mile island. Yeah. Uh, off the coast of San yeah, Diego. It is pretty small. It is a, a quite a weird section of things but uh really it was a it was a reaction to what i feel is a very underutilized thing and that's memorials especially war memorials right uh my reaction to you and to a lot of the spec war community is that the people in charge of these memorials or one they don't really immoralize or they're usually nouns right a person place or thing so they're kind of a t- literal translation, which I always found kind of bad, right? How many people can really um, get into the shoes of a uh, guy holding an M4, you know, carrying another guy on his back with, you know, the, the kind of Rambo-esque style mm-hmm. or like a, a, a statue of uh, Chris Kyle, like yeah. folded arms, flexing his buys, uh, that, I mean, who's really like... a the people that know Chris Kyle know Chris Kyle, and they yeah. might be, you know, moved to tears over uh, Chris Kyle. But uh, my idea was to incorporate things like um, um, so basically, it was a name wall uh, that allowed light to come through onto a, a screen on the other side. And uh, on the screen on the other side, so basically, all the names are in light. Uh, and the idea was that the, uh, the idea of colors, the idea that uh, they raise the flag every morning and they bring the uh, flag down at sunset. And so the, the names would rise and fall every single day. Yeah. You know, the names would rise and fall. So it, it, it did a bunch of these things. It did a bunch of these uh, change of command ceremonies. Where it, so all these things are incorporated into the memorial in the museum. Museum was interesting too. Again, take on a bunch of different things. But the idea was simple. It was to take these core rituals that we do all the time and apply them in the memorial so that other people see them regardless of whether or not they know about colors, right? right. You don't have to know colors to see names made in light that slowly move throughout the day. And the very when the sun's setting on the beach in Coronado, those names are gone. Yeah. Th- they'll immediately get the kind of reverence yeah. of, of, of the idea of colors. Well, why don't you back up and talk about sort of didn't you draw some inspiration from the Vietnam Memorial and how oh yeah, yeah, yeah. the kind of just how how that explain how how it came out to be kind of give a history yeah, lesson yeah, yeah. and like yeah yeah uh, the Vietnam Memorial one of the greatest memorials I think I've ever seen in my life um, now if you ever go to Washington D.C. you'll go through all the other memorials although all the other war memorials are the nouns right the the, the person place or things they're uh, you think of like the the flag raising at Iwo Jima. It's a bunch of Marines and one corpsman mm-hmm. uh, pushing up a flag, and it's a, a literal depiction of that scene happening, right? And then you go and you you can go to the other ones. You can go to the Washington Memorial, which is much more phallic, and uh, um, you can go to the uh, Lincoln Memorial, which is a literally a giant statue of Lincoln, and then you go to the Vietnam Memorial, and which was. Uh, um, one, uh, the, it was a Yale student that won uh, out of it, uh, and she's r- really amazing. Uh, r- one of my fa- favorite uh, uh, landscape architects. Um, and this m- memorial is just so simple. It is two uh, granite uh, walls. The granite is uh, really, really, really dark, almost onyx-like color, uh, reflective um, and it shows your your reflection in it. And so that as you read these names, which are not alphabetical. Right. Did I ever tell you the... Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's not done alphabetical because she was given the name sheet and they, she, they told her to make it alphabetical. And she said, well, I'm going to have six panels of John Smith. I'm going to have nine, parents, uh, nine panels of George whoever. Yeah. And so that would be so demeaning... Uh, and it would, I mean, how would you feel if you're looking for John Smith and you had to go through six panels? Yeah. And you're like, and that, know, you which, start to lose that connection that you're right. looking for, right? Yeah, and, and that's what this is all about, to kind of make connections and stuff. And so uh, in it, she cites that let's do it chronological. Let's do it but day by day. 
literally by the hour that they're reported KIA or MIA. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's going to make it hard to kind of decipher at first. But that's part of the part of the process. And she thought it was part of the ritual is going through and finding the day that is so now it's connecting an event to a person. Yeah. It's making it a little bit more uh, personable. Uh, it creates space. It's n- it's not a it's not an actual wall. It's actually a car, a scar in the earth. It's a triangle uh, that connects two other monuments. So it, n- not only does it make space, connects two other monuments, and it's phenomenological, meaning that it's dynamic. That it, it's a static thing. It doesn't change. But the weather, it's outside, so the weather changes. It's super reflective. So you can go there in the winter and see it in the white of snow. And it's a different thing. You can go there when it's raining. It's a very different thing. You can go there when it's sunny. And it's a, it's a different thing. And yeah. you can go there. I mean, you can go there throughout the times, fall, autumn. Uh, it's also reflective. So you always see these things change in it. Right. And uh, I think it's. And what, what about like the fact that you're walking down and like kind of yeah. lo- losing yeah, yeah. the. Because there's all the other distractions there in the mm. mall. It's isolating, yeah. so it's it's again, it's a scar, it's a crevice in the earth. Instead of making it, you know, up, it goes down. So as you walk more and more into it, you get isolated. You go down into it, and it's just you, the names, and this is pretty great. So there's a uh, a whole um, field behind you that they rope off so that no one can walk or go in that field. Mm-hmm. So it's literally just you, the names, and an empty field behind you. Right. A- a- and as you look at the name wall, you are reflecting it in just a field behind you. There's mm-hmm. no, there's no, you can't walk on that field. And it's just this. And I mean, I can only imagine. I've never been there during the winter. I've always wanted to go. Yeah. Um, it's just this, the epitome of. She got very simple, very, 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 very to the point. But it's so poetic, and it's it's a very non literal translation of what it's like. I mean, they're very easy. Actually, it's kind of sad. So, some people were upset with this because they didn't have soldiers carrying rifles. Yeah. So they eventually put at one end they put soldiers carrying rifles. It's like the machine gunner. The machine one, gunner. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. There's also another one for nurses. Mm-hmm. Uh, they wanted a, um, uh, a memorial for nurses, and so at two ends. Uh, of them, there's there's a nurse's memorial, and there's one of the machine gunner and some other uh, bronze statues, like like you've seen before. Yeah, I just and and when visiting this this memorial, I was just overwhelmed that this is so different. And I was watching people do uh, etchings. Yep, I was watching people meet other people. I I watched uh, a biker gang literally cry as they met another person. And, uh, you know, a younger person, because they're trying to find their great-grandfather, right? Mm -hmm. And this guy happened to know a guy that died on the same day as his great-grandfather. But it was was amazing to me to see that, to see these two people that otherwise... We both lost somebody on this day. On this day, right? And so... That you've now linked, you've now linked two human beings together by a horrible tragedy. Right. But... In in the outcome of that, you have this piece of architecture, which is literally it's the simplest architecture ever. It's it's two walls, right? Mm-hmm. In essentiality, it's it's two walls. And I'll go even further. Uh, if you have, have you ever been to the tomb of unknown? Yeah, the tomb of unknown. I worked it, there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's right. That's right. I forgot. Yeah. I completely forgot. Um, yeah, man, that is a hunk of marble. Mm-hmm. That is nothing. It's it, the tomb itself isn't the actual tomb. I mean, what you think of it as a tomb, yeah. and it, it is all ritual. It yeah. is, and it's the the simplest ritual of them all. It's the old stand your post and change of post. Yeah, I mean, it's, there's it's a glamorous change of post, but it is a you know it's the first thing you learn in boot camp is general orders and how to stand post. Yeah. I mean, general orders are how to stand post, and it is. I mean, people go there all the time just to see the change of command ceremony. Yeah. And, uh, change of command, I'm sorry. Uh, change of post. Or uh, wreath layings and... Wreath layings yeah, and yeah. that kind of stuff. But I was saying that just normally... Yeah, yeah. The, yeah, just the, the, change the, of the guard, guard. guard. Yeah, change of the guard. Change of the guard uh, ceremony. And it's the simplest. It's the first thing you learn in boot camp. But 
it is all ritual and less about architecture, but more about the architecture kind of symbolizing a ritual that is continuous. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I mean, so those two things were the catalyst for this uh, project. And uh, it got me thinking that a lot of memorials don't take these things and and you can do you can keep doing it Mm -hmm. it's it's just taking the values of said client which the memorial war whether whether it be um whether you're embodying all the seals or all the marines Mm -hmm. and their values and throwing that back into the memorial it 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 actually just became about design really It, it just became about taking your values and what you care about and making and representing that into yeah. a piece of architecture that could somehow someone could relate to without. Yeah. I, I think a lot of people. Well, it doesn't even have to be a military war memorial. No, like, no, no, like no, no, think no, of no, the, no. Uh, yeah. the 9/11 no, memorial, which, is, which if you haven't I been, haven't, I haven't been yet. Oh, it's fantastic. Yeah. It's it is now. I was I was very skeptical whenever I went. Uh, being a uh, an architecture student, I was like, oh, yeah. you know, and I pushed up the glasses, and the nose was a little up in the air, and man, it is out of this world. It's really, really, really the, the memorial itself, the museum, uh, both are connected. Uh, the museum, you walk in. Uh, I, I, I'm literally smiling. For those of you if you were watching, <laughs> you will literally see me smiling. That's not at uh, the tragedy. That is literally at this amazing museum. You walk in the the foundations. So those are the uh, the fountains are the two footprints. Yeah. Well, the foundation walls underneath are where the where the museum is. So you walk around those foundational walls and these, I mean, massive, massive, like 70, 80 foot high concrete piers. You walk around underneath. Uh, and you, you, they, they saved a lot of the, uh, debris. And so these are like wrenched, uh, pieces of steel, um, that used to hold up this, these towers yeah. are, are gone. And, and now they're, they're kind of, now they become kind of a relic kind of, of, uh, the past of, of what happened. And it is out of this world. I suggest everyone go, um, there's cell phone. I mean, cell phones, there are phones, Mm-hmm. Where you can pick up and hear phone calls. If you ever wanted to know what our purpose was in these wars, Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, and they've been muddled throughout the years and that kind of stuff, mm-hmm. go listen to those um, phone calls of a guy on a plane leaving his loved one in New York that he knows that is going. Or uh, I'm sorry, uh, the the ones that have the phone calls one are um, the DC ones. Uh, the the it's the plane that went down, mm-hmm. Flight eighty eight or whatever it's called. Uh, the, the one that flew into the Pentagon. The one that the one that didn't even make it to the Pentagon because they, oh, they fought they, them. They, oh, right, right, right. The one that fell down in the field. In the field, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, they have some phone calls from that of them leaving messages or just the messages, and they have several messages. Um, and it is, it is everything that you would want in in a museum and in a remembrance of that time. Yeah. Uh, Very powerful. Kind of like at the, uh, the Holocaust museum where they have the videos where you walk, you have to walk up and like actually like look over to like see, uh, the things that like happened during the Holocaust and everything. Yeah. You're getting that very like, you know, human factor of like this. It's an actual recording, right? You're watching a video or you're listening to like, another human being like actively talking you know yeah well that's that's one thing that uh i've always found that's been very hard uh is the stimuli as we get used to being bombarded by things it's very hard for us to confront these real these things and uh we just kind of gloss over it history we kind of gloss over and that kind of stuff mm-hmm. uh, one of the amazing things about these museums one you're dealing with a historical event that was what 9-11 uh, so it was 2001, so it's not that long ago. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's in our lifetime. Now, of course, anyone born after that, I mean, they're teaching, I mean, this is crazy, they are teaching 9-11 as a historical event in textbooks, and people are growing up not remembering it. Wow. That's that's wild to think of because it was so, such an impactful moment for, like, so yeah, many yeah, of yeah. us. Yeah, Even, without like, a doubt. Even, the, the joined the military based off of it, like... Um, that's wild that like people, yeah, it's happening to be taught as like this 
you know, historical events of younger people who like weren't alive. Or, and, weren't or, alive or, 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 or too or young they, to yeah, remember, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. Or too young to remember. Yeah, it's it's just insane. But uh yeah, so th- th- I got into the architecture thing and I got into that. And it, honestly, you can do it with anything. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But it was uh I found sorely lacking in the war memorial and just in general, I think uh uh memorials uh kind of ask very little. I think those those two are really great. You should go if you're in DC, go go see those. Um but uh you can do it you could do it with anything. It doesn't have to be a war memorial, it doesn't have to be it didn't it doesn't have to be a memorial, the museum or whatever. Basically you're just taking the w- once I learned that I was like really intrigued. Although one thing that uh was really great about doing a, a military memorial was there is these rich traditions that I could draw from, these actual yeah. ceremonies, these traditions. Whereas like when you're doing kind of uh, uh now that I work in the architecture field, when you're doing a office building, mm-hmm. what rituals do you have in an office building? What what uh, it's it's very different. And it, mm-hmm. They're there. They're much more mundane and as robust and you can't be like this. But uh it's it's uh it's much more low key and uh, the military kind of situation was that you came from a background of tradition so you're able to kind of pull it's kind of like a uh, when you're writing stories uh uh someone wants to me it's like you always want to pull on the heartstrings you know you always, yeah. always want to do that uh and when trying to find those in in a in kind of a robust background where they have a bunch of tradition and history it's very easy to pull those heartstrings. Uh, that you would want. It's very, it's much harder in an office supply or a data center, or, you know, something like that. Yeah, yeah. I think it, in those it becomes more of like uh, sort of c- current or even maybe looking forward. You know. Yeah. Do, yeah, do, yeah. do you see a shift there? Like, because um, I'm at, I'm just trying to think if I was to go to design a data center or you know some. Or let's say a design working space or something, you know, building where there's going to be a design firm or something. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm th- I'm thinking more into the 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 future. How can we make this like a better working functional space, or you know, or how how can we represent design that's going to like actually like have a active effect on people and what they're doing currently and like in the future and like kind of inspiring yeah. as, op- as opposed to like a historical reference of, right, right, of oh, a tradition. Yeah, here's yeah. where design started, you know, right, right. in the building. Do, well, you, th- do you see that as being different or? Yeah. Well, uh, one of the things that uh, is really interesting to me uh, and one of my favorite architects has, has always done this. Uh, Louis Kahn used to rename things. So mm-hmm. instead of us doing a school, he'd be like, all right, what's the goal of the school? a place for people to learn, which sometimes means a very different thing than a designing a school. Mm-hmm. And like, what do you want? Uh, one of my favorite buildings, uh, the Seattle Central Library, got a lot of flack for its crazy form. Uh, it's a very funky building that looks like it's a bunch of these buildings stacked on top of each other. And uh, in actuality, um, it was all out of... Um, program and basically basically it was a bunch of boxes what they knew how to design and they didn't know how to design these kind of interstitial spaces so they kind of lined it and that's what came out of the form it was very much this kind of hyper rationalization um and you get this kind of crazy form and actually the librarians were the ones that spoke up for it whenever they started to protest it and said no this is we don't know what it is it looks really weird but it's everything we want and uh oh it's it's an interesting thing. So so part of our job is to look at the program, look at you know what they want and whether or not it's a good idea. Uh, matter of fact, when they were doing that building um, in Seattle, uh, the guy that was doing the building, Joshua Prince Ramos, um, guy owner of uh, Rex Architecture, now uh, used to at this point in time there was OMA Architecture. Um, was looking at it and he literally was getting like, is this even a good idea? Cause Google at the time was spending billions of dollars to try and kill the book. So they were going to do oh, a yeah. public library. Is this even, is this even a thing? And matter of fact, one of the things they did was they looked at the program, the, the document that they had written about, you know, what they wanted in a building. And they just gave that, 
back to them and said, here's a chart of the things that you list as what you want. And they were like, oh, well, we don't want those things. They were like, okay, the kicker is this is exactly what you gave us. We just reorganized it. Yeah. And they were like, oh, well, maybe we do want those things. Like it was yeah. – and, and a lot of that is – is kind of self evaluation and kind of going through it, but yeah, I think I think the main thing you do in designing anything is uh, you come up with joint positions. And uh, if anyone knows uh, Joshua Prince Ramos, he'll, he'll always this is one of his things, and it's one of the things that I agree with. If you come up with joint positions of what the design should do, I don't think you should talk aesthetics. I don't believe in talking aesthetics. Mm-hmm. I don't believe in talking, you know. Um, the other things, I think you should come up with not even talk about architecture, talk about joint things that this thing should do. Right. Should do this, should do this, should be about this, these values, this and this. And it should always do those things. That way, so when you do the final thing, if it does all those things, what does it matter if it looks like whatever it looks like, right? Yeah. And that's one of the things. If it if you're into data center and you want to improve efficiency and you have to move these things around to a very un um, typical uh, layout, then you do those things. You know, you just it's it's uh, pretty easy to the, if if your thing's about efficiency. Yeah. And the thing nowadays is all about it's all about green efficiency, right? It's all mm-hmm. about energy efficiency, which is important. I'm not going to lie; it's very important. But uh, I'm constantly reminded that uh, there are mother, other things in play, right? If you want the efficiency thing, if you're always arguing about green efficiency or the efficiency of um, how much it costs, then that's a very simple that, – you need a computer to do that. A computer can tell you how much your overhangs need to be. You, you can type in and work in a computer model that uh, will do the most of efficient thing. If you want an artist, if you want – uh, that's where the art and architecture kind of fuse together and the values. So let, let's say there's a uh, three-story high view of all of New Orleans. This, this happens to be one building that I bring up in particular. There's a school in New Orleans uh, on the West Bank that that looks uh, at all a view of all of New Orleans, and but it's on the wrong side that you would get a lot of heat gain. So you w- normally wouldn't put a window there. They put a giant glaze wall, and they said, you know what, this view – of all of New Orleans is more important than energy efficiency in this building. Right. And uh, I think it's that and a bunch of other things that architecture kind of lends me to where you get to make those choices of what, That's cool. what, what matters. Right? Yeah. What, what do you want to matter? And that's why I think coming up whenever you're looking at anything – Coming up with a set of values that are the core belief. They, they, these things, when you, when you come to a rock, right, waterfall, coming down, you hit a rock, what are the core values that you can go and I can do this thing and the core values are still there? Yeah. And, yeah. and honestly – Dude, I, I love this. It's like, <laughs> it's, like, it's like coming full circle. Yeah, really. yeah, yeah. It, it really is because um, when, you're, when you're talking about that, it's like, you know – the way they're able to hand that list back to those people and be like, dude, this is exactly what you wanted. We mm-hmm. just like re reorganized the wording here. Yeah. And, um, having a lot of artist friends, I'm not an artist <laughs> uh, right, by right. any means, but even trying to like work with people in business and stuff. And so many people have difficulty telling people like, Hey, here's what we need. And like coming up with that list you were just talking about. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I think it's so important. To be able to do that without a in, doubt, man. in so many aspects of your life, right? Yeah, like uh, like being able to come up with here's what's important to me now, right? Right. Whereas working in medicine was very important to me, you know, several years ago. That's not on this list anymore, right? Right, right. So why try and do that thing, you know? Yeah, yeah. And and just constantly realigning each each stage of your life you're finding yourself in you're rechecking in with with your value list and like and you know what i mean what do you think about that yeah i mean i I think i think i did that right i think i I found something that um would i would continue like so the values that i instilled in me uh with the military and what i wanted to do that kind of fire and drive and that kind of stuff these are is, is a very 
and it may look very different, but the values weren't in, I didn't have that thing in the medicine. Mm -hmm. And then when I moved into art and architecture and that kind of stuff, I found those same values kind of coming up that want to be better, that need to do that, 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 uh, that drive and and I you know I went and checked it I went I went back and said dude is this really what I want to do I don't know man I don't know at the end of the day whenever they they, they closed the book and said all right you can go home you know whatever class is done and I stayed and I was kind of tinkering with things and it was like late at night I didn't know what I was doing but I I knew it uh, I was like confused and then I, I just realized. Seven hours had gone by, and I'm still staring at this piece of page, drawing, working on these sections, working on these drawings, and then it all of a sudden clicked. And I was yeah. like, yeah, I just... It, also, if you can lose yourself in it, you're, you're in a pretty good thing. You're, you haven't made the, the wrong choice. If you can yeah. lose yourself, that want, that need, and you, and you forget time... Yeah. I wouldn't even say it's losing yourself. You may be like... Uh, you may be losing your surroundings or the other right, people, right. but like you're actually finding yourself. Yeah, it's yeah, a weird yeah, thing right, in so losing, yeah. in I guess, in losing yourself in the sense of letting yourself kind of fall into it. Right, you're actually finding yourself. But yeah, without a doubt. I mean, like, yeah, that other stuff kind of fades to the. You know, I mean, yeah. unless you've like really been it. Uh, for example, unless you've ever walked point in a squad formation, <laughs> you you have no clue what that feels like. Right? Yeah. Uh, and I'm, I'm not speaking from personal experiences, but I've he I've heard very similar things where like everything's heightened, your mm -hmm. eyes, your sense, your, that that kind of like you're always on edge, right? And like everything else fades to this kind of back, right? That same sense I happened when I was working on a project real late, and that kind of um, everything kind of fading out, and this is the, this is it, this is the thing. Regardless of where I'm staring at a computer screen or whether I'm like gluing little sticks together or drawing, mm -hmm. um, drawing was the easiest to kind of lose myself in. And, yeah. it, and a lot of times, and I know you, this has happened to any skilled profession where um, I don't think about doing something. It's just kind of my hand was kind of moving and I was kind of like operating on kind of autopilot, right? And I was kind of like feeling it out. That happens, that happens all the time now. And something that happened in the military all the time, but I hadn't felt that sense about anything else until this. So. Yeah. Uh, got a little... Yeah, don't worry about that. But, <laughs> um, dude, so... Just, uh, I think, wrapping up, like, uh, I think that we're kind of end, ending on a good good note there. Unless yeah, you, unless yeah. Unless you had anything else. No, uh, no, no. Unless you want to do the Lieutenant Speckle story. Oh, dude. Yeah, we can. Uh, let's yeah, let's uh, let's hit up the Lieutenant Speckle story because that kind of goes into, um, you know. Oh, I gotta stretch it out for this, man. Yeah, I don't know. We'll end end on a light note. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Dude, so we, uh, so when we found ourselves working in that clinic together, <laughs> you as know, we found ourselves. Uh, I guess it, I found a way to tie it back in. Okay. Yeah. Uh, right. Is. You know, we weren't, even though both of us were injured, we weren't looking yeah. to just stay laid up and not doing anything. Like That's, we, that we, is certain. We, we put in work in the clinic. We did a really good job. Fantastic. And job. then uh, Chief Dorian was uh, nice enough to let us go work out in the afternoon, and we'd work out for like several hours or whatever. Yeah. But so this leads us into Lieutenant Speckle's story. So. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll set the mood here. I think you had already been transferred. You had just been transferred to wherever you were. I, I think you got orders to BRC. Uh, right? I think I did a short PSI stand over at First Recon Battalion. As I was, right. like, it was like That's a right. week or something. Yeah. before I went to BRC. And uh, I had, uh, of course, gotten off, and uh, they were like, "Go, you know, get out of here. Don't be seen. Mm -hmm. You can go work out, or you can stay here." I was like, "I'm going to go work out," and uh, so I go and. Uh, uh, I change out of all my clothes. I'm wearing uh, silkies, tennis shoes, you know, go fasters, and uh, um, some new New Balance specials. It's hot and out. It's hot out. I have no hair on my head, so w water or water sweat will pour down my face. So I wear a sweet red, bright red bandana, and go for a run in the uh, glorious hills of Camp Pendleton, California. 
And uh, who did I meet while running uh, down this uh, path? I'm, and I'm waiting for you. I've I've gone to your Jeep. Yeah, yeah. I'm at your Jeep. And I was like, all right. And you were like, you had given me a time frame. You're like, oh, I'm going to be done or whatever. And I was like, all right, well, I'm going to go for a run on these hills. So I go for a run. I'm working my tan, you know. And I go for a run. And uh, I run into some some chief, a chief, uh, some gunny. And man, this white truck passes me. I knew exactly what it was. I'm, I'm running and I'm, I'm wearing literally no clothing. I, if anyone knows, silkies are like half shorts. My, my ass is definitely hanging out of this thing. And, uh, and no shirt and a red bandana. So I look like a, just a, a goober. Uh, either that or I look like uh, I'm working in a L.A. somewhere. Yeah. Uh, and no joke, this truck comes by me full speed and slams on its brakes. I mean, it, and it's a dirt road, so everything's coming up. And he gets out and he's fired up because he sees me wearing the black silkies. And he's like, you're yeah, one of my Marines. And so he's yelling at me, hardcore, going at me. And he's just spitting in my face when he comes up. And, uh, and I see this guy, and uh, I was like, look, this can go one or two ways, Nick. This can go, oh, I'm really sorry. I'm some corpsman on hold or whatever, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Or I could impersonate an officer. So I'm going to go ahead and <laughs> go for the uh, criminally offensing one. Yeah, the uh, one where you don't actually end up in trouble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I, I immediately uh, say I'm, um, I'm sorry, I'm uh, Lieutenant, and it, the name came out of nowhere. I, don't, I think it was so stupid. Because that's, well, that's something they do. I mean, they, they always, when they stop you, they're like, what's your name? Like, who, yeah, yeah. who are you oh, yeah, with? Because yeah. they, they want to talk to your leadership and tell them how fucked up you are. Right. That's exactly like, what happened. So you get in trouble. Uh, yeah. And so uh, the first inclination was to outrank him. Mm -hmm. So I immediately said I was a lieutenant. Uh and so he, and he, he's taken aback, and the name that I came up with on the spot was Speckles. Yeah. Uh, don't don't know why. Uh, don't know how. It was almost so dumb that it had to be a name. Yeah. Like if I said like Smith or something like that, he'd be like, "Oh, you're lying." But Speckles, who the fuck's gonna lie about Speckles, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, sure enough, I was like uh, Lieutenant Speckles at the <laughs> Naval Hospital, and he is yeah. like, Wh "Where? Where?" I was like, "I'm an ENT resident at the Naval Hospital, at Camp Pendleton." He's looking at me. He's looking for some wavering, some wavering. Yeah. Well, this time I am fully committed. I am. Yeah. I stare him down and I look bewildered at his actions. Like, what are you doing? Yeah. And he's like, well, sir, you can't be running around like this. I was like, running around like what? Yeah. And I act just like I'm, I just got transferred. I didn't say I just got transferred. I said like yeah. a month ago, whatever. Never run this part. Um, and you know, went for a run. And so he promptly, I think he even gave me a shirt or something like that. He was like, you can't be running around naked. He kept referring to me as naked. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and, uh, with shirtless, body. with his shirtless body, you know, who would, you know, supple young men around. Uh, so immediately he stated all this and, and I am fully committed. And he kept asking what, what command I'm under. And I said, CEO of the hospital, which I don't remember now. But I said the CEO of the hospital went through that, and I'm sure he called some ENT <laughs> looking for Lieutenant Speckles. Yeah. You know, as soon as I left, after he was rolling it through his mind, like yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but as soon as he got there, I took like a turn and whatever. Anyway, I tell you that story to tell you another story. So I mainly got uh, together with you after you got off, told you that story. We're laughing about it all the way down, and you had mentioned to me, you, yes kind of look like a pirate i was like dude you look like a pirate with that red bandana on her head and i was like you know what i kind of do pirate night pirate night i don't know i we, as we were driving so we went down one of my buddies lived in san diego ned deer yeah who's getting married by the way oh wow fun, fun fact uh happy congratulations engagement. ned congratulations ned uh and uh so we decide to go down to stop at the party store mm-hmm and to get pirate costumes because we're going to dress as pirates this Friday night in uh, in downtown San Diego. And go, yeah, on PB. And, go, and, and, and PB. PB, yeah. I'm sorry, not downtown. PB. And uh, so we go and we find a small plastic. Uh, uh, it's a parrot. It's, a, it's really a parrot. And we duct tape it to my shoulder. Yeah. And rename him. Lieutenant Speckles. Lieutenant Speckles. And uh, so we go to a bar. We go to several bars. And we were actually, do you remember this? 
we were trying to come up with reasons that we were dressed as pirates. Because we were the only ones. Because obviously there was not uh, pirates out that night. Mm-hmm. Not too many. And uh, and PB, Pacific Beach, California. And uh, so we decide, we, we, and we get gone through, like, maybe we came from a party, or maybe yeah. we came from this. You know what? Let's go with, and I, th- I think this is the ingenious of you. <laughs> uh, you said it's pirate night. Yeah. And I said, okay, I don't know what that means, but whatever. And while we're at the bar, someone asked us, as they're t- inclined to do, yeah. I have a plastic parrot yeah. duct taped to my shoulder. Yeah, what the hell are you guys what, doing? What are you guys doing? Yeah. And you promptly respond with, it's pirate night. You get your first five? Yeah. Is it five? First five drinks free if you pay the door and you dress as a pirate. Yeah. And he was bewildered. He was like, yeah. oh. And I go, wait, watch this. And I like turn to the bartender. I'm like, hey, two more drinks. And then like he games and like gives them to me. And I'm like, yeah, see? Nothing. And, <laughs> and what the person didn't know is I had already opened or, a tab. Already opened the tab. So they're as just like, people are inclined put, to do. Yeah, they put the drinks on the tab. But like I just turned to him and go, oh, yeah. Uh, two more drinks, and so the bartender needed to put on our tabs. But all this person sees is, oh yeah, that bartender just poured them two drinks and gave it to them. Yeah, and didn't ask for any money in return, and so it just solidified it. It it made it it made it an actual thing. It was all night, so we we had met mm-hmm. uh, several people. Uh, by the way, uh, throughout the course of the night, do you know how much money we wasted on buying the plastic parrot that was duct taped to my shoulder? Shots. <laughs> We would literally just go up like, to the bar, order shots, and we'd be like, "Yeah, one more." You just give it over just, your shoulder. Yeah. Just, just fling it over my shoulder onto a plastic parrot, um, which well, Lieutenant Speckles was thirsty. Yeah, he he gets thirsty over over the shoulder. Uh, so throughout the night, when a lot of debauchery happened, just just a lot of drinking, and uh, the best solidification of this entire story is uh, two weeks later, Ned Deer calls me up. It's like, no joke, dude. I'm at uh, the Sand Dollar or wherever, the Sand Coaster or wherever, yeah. whatever bar we went to. He's like, there are two pirates here. I am not joking. There are two pirates here. <laughs> so no joke. Yeah. Two, th- this was two weeks later. Yeah. Two weeks later, Pirate Night was still going strong. We started a thing. And, yeah. uh, and we've started many things. And I hope to start a lot more. Yeah. Yeah, bro. Well, dude, uh, this is definitely definitely a fun podcast. I like diving into a lot of stuff, um, and, and that man, that I just can't even wipe this grin off my face because I'm thinking about that night, yeah, and, you know, and the many others of debaucherous stuff we did, got into. But yeah, 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 um, like teleportation and all that. So but, in a in an amazing yeah. dance off. Oh, dude, the only yeah. dance off I ever lost or enjoyed losing. <laughs> well, there was that one here in Louisiana. But. Well, let's, the, not, let's not talk about yeah. that. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, dude, it's it's been really fun. If you uh, are inclined to, I highly suggest it. Check out Nick's art. Daily drawings on your uh, Instagram, Yeah, Instagram. Right? Uh, Nicholas.lot is my Instagram name. How do you... N-I-C-H-O-L-A-S okay. dot L-O-T-T. Yeah. And... It's actually, I actually look forward to those. It's like, they're, they're like popping up. And I'm like, dude, it's it's always something really, I don't know. I always really enjoy them. It's really cool. And uh, I, yeah, I need to start drawing every day. Yeah. Because, I mean, I think it's, I think that's how you get better if you don't. Without a doubt. Yeah. Yeah, the one thing that, that, that I always say, just in an art standpoint, a lot of people say they can't draw. Mm-hmm. And which is a, a fair assessment. Maybe they can't. Yeah. Uh, but uh, one thing that is like that I've always said is that, uh, and I've noticed just from mine, and I was a semi gifted artist mm-hmm. that has gotten so much better, even in the last couple months of just get, of just drawing, right? And so one of the things it's like, yeah, you can't draw, right? How many times have you have you ever practiced drawing? Yeah. No. <laughs> Oh, you've yeah. never you've never done it before in your life. Yeah. What is that the same thing as like, hey, do you want to uh, play piano? I don't know how to play piano. And you go, okay, but does that mean you can learn? 
You're yeah. like, oh, I guess you could learn. Yeah. And they don't like treat it like that. They treat yeah. it as like either this innate gift. Oh, it's this natural like. Oh, it's this natural it was phenomenon. Just blessed in your genetics. Yeah, you just yeah. you just had it to begin with, and you can't ever get it. It's a learned skill. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's literally if you think about it, it's moving a little pencil or a brush, whatever medium that you choose to do. Mm-hmm. Which, by the way, uh, you turned me on to uh, the coffee uh, painter uh, who paints with coffee. Uh, God, shout out to him on Instagram. He is out of this world. How did I do that? I don't know. You had requested. Did I joke about it? Oh, yeah. I was saying something about using coffee. Was... Yeah, something like that. And there's yeah. a fantastic, oh, man, I think his name is Coffee Painter. Mm-hmm. I got a, uh, uh, actually, I think it's another buddy I turned me on to him. But you had said something about coffee painting or yeah. something like that. But uh, anyway, uh, people look at this kind of innate skill. Mm-hmm. And it is definitely a learned skill. And mm-hmm. if you just do it. Just, I mean, it's moving a little thing around on a piece of paper. Yeah. When you say it like that, you're like, oh, well, yeah, I can learn that. To reflect whether something you're seeing in your mind or something you're actually, like, looking at and drawing. Yeah, either either or. I mean, both of them are learned skills. Yeah. And the the ones in your mind, there's no difference between looking at something and then drawing from your mind. Mm -hmm. The the difference is uh, you have actual reference in front of you. And you have reference in your mind. Mm-hmm. Imagination. What? <laughs> yeah. And uh, so that uh, both those things, and a lot of it has to do with just knowing proportional value. I mean, these are taught things, proportional value, how big humans are, what your face does whenever you tilt it back, knowing the planes of the face. Uh, this is just drawing people, but you could do this for anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, the way core shadows form, the way shadows form. I mean, all of art is a trickery. It's It's a... 2D thing made to look 3D. So it's tricking your mind. So learning these tricks that help trick your mind, yeah. make drawings, like make them, they, they become, instead of flat representational, they become a tricked 3D image, which that's what it is. I mean, a photograph, I mean, we're, we're talking through, we're getting a picture taken by this monitor. Yeah. That is a bunch, that is our likeness rendered into a bunch of dots with different colors and different shading of different values written ac- across the screen, right? Yeah. So you see yourself, right? But in actuality, you see a bunch of dots. Yeah. Well, all we are... Our voices going through these electrical cables and right, like exactly. waves. <laughs> yeah. And being like it's, it's a translation of that, that right? Yeah. Uh, so that's all you are is, is you're mimicking that with whatever medium that you're, you're choosing, right? Mm-hmm. Whether you're drawing from a picture and you're drawing from of, of your mind... Uh, that's another thing. You're drawing from a picture that's in your mind. There's no difference between that. Uh, um, starting out, use reference. I think reference is very good. It teaches you a lot. Uh, but proportional value, and those things can just be taught to you, and you know it. I mean, yeah. it's 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 a shame that people think of this. It's a gift or not. It's definitely a learned skill, and you can learn it. Just you, And the coolest thing, coolest thing ever, is to go through these sketchbooks in the back. These are yeah. some of my, this is, uh, I think, the last year. So I have like six or seven sketchbooks. Coolest thing is to go back and look at how horrible, like literally they're horrid. Like I would yeah. not show them to other people. And then look at the stuff now. And you have this collection of things. That you really, just do one drawing a day. Yeah. You don't need cancer to do it. And it feels good to create. Of yeah. course. Yeah, yeah, of course. Of course. You, I mean, just uh also to have a, I mean, it's really cool to see the transition from, also, drawing has this innate ability to bring you back to, oh, I remember doing that. I remember being there and doing that. I remember that mm-hmm. coffee. I remember, I remember doing this. I remember doing that. It has this innate ability to the tie, bring you back. Tie yeah, you into tie a you memory. Into a memory about, yeah. or a place or a thing. I usually, in, when I went to Europe, I used to take the, um, um, the receipts and just, um, what's it called? Um, Leave them in, and then later on, I uh, taped them or stapled them into the sketchbook. Oh wow! So yeah. they're so like literally, if I got a croissant from somewhere, there's there's a sketchbook in there with a croissant receipt from it in there. But it brings you back to that place. I did this yeah. there, this right here. So it's this kind of like sequence of like, oh, I drew it there. That yeah. is cool. Yeah, yeah. All right, dude. Well, it's been fun. Yeah, uh, bro. Th- thanks for letting me uh, crash and uh, yeah, hang out with you, doubt, dude. Man. It's been a been a blast podcasting with you. So, all yeah, right, bro. let's uh, let's end this one up. <laughs>